Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In this series we're looking at famous mathematical problems and today we're going to go back to Euclid and talk about some of the construction problems found in his Book 1 of the Elements. Written around 300 BC, the Elements is the greatest mathematical textbook of all time and has been studied and revered by many, many generations of mathematics students. Although in the last hundred years, its importance in education has dropped off markedly. And we'll say a little bit about that in today's lecture. So, we don't know that much about Euclid. We know that he lived around this time, that he studied with Plato's students in Athens, that he taught in Alexandria, the famous center of learning in Egypt, established by Alexander the Great, that he compiled a coherent framework for geometry by putting together work of previous researchers together with his own insights and new developments. So there are 13 books altogether in the elements. Book 1, the one that's most studied, has 48 propositions, mostly concerning lines and circle constructions using a compass, and concerning triangles, parallelograms, and culminating in Pythagoras' theorem. So book one actually has a combination of theory and constructions. If you look through it, and I hope that some of you will be encouraged to have a look at Euclid's elements directly from watching this video, you will see that some of the propositions are theoretical, and others are very practical and show you how to do things. It's those rather practical construction issues that we're going to be talking about in this video today. So our famous math problem number 12 is the constructions of book one of the elements. And this is going to be a relatively easy subject. The difficulty level is somewhere between one and three. In fact, the ones that I'm going to talk about today probably are no more than two. But some of the other later problems in Book 1 are a little bit more complicated. Our basic tools are the main tools for doing geometry back in the days of the ancient Greeks. The ruler, which is perhaps better thought of as a straight edge, so that's just a straight piece of wood perhaps, which is not necessarily marked. We don't need a subdivision into, uh, into units. And the other one is the compass that allows us to draw circles. So we're able to draw straight lines and we're able to draw circles. Those are the basic tools for Greek geometry. And Euclid starts by laying out some postulates. And these are assumptions that he wants to make about things that we are able to do. And these assumptions cannot be reduced easily to prior simpler assumptions. So in some sense they're the beginnings or the, 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 the pillars on which he builds his geometry. Alright, there are five of them and it's important that we have a, a quick look at them. Just to remind ourselves about what we are able to do. So, the first postulate is that a straight line can be drawn between two points. We're working in the plane. We assume we have a definition or an understanding of points, of lines, of circles. And the first postulate says that if we have two points, like these two here, then we can draw a straight line between them. And we know how to do that. We use our straight edge. We place the straight edge on the two points, and then we take our pen and connect them. The second postulate is that lines can be extended. So for example, this line here, which you might think of as a line segment, it certainly looks like that at finite now, but according to Euclid we are allowed to extend lines as much as we want. So we could extend this line by placing our straight edge there and keeping on going. Of course, we're limited by the page that we have or the space available, but theoretically at least we're able to extend lines as much as we need to. And we can extend them in either direction. The third postulate concerns the construction of a circle. A circle is a very fundamental 
beautiful object for the ancient Greeks. And the postulate says that a circle can be drawn with any center and any point on it. So there's the center of the circle. There's a point on the circle. And we're going to assume that we have an instrument, usually a compass, that is placed here, one point on the circle, the other movable point with usually a pencil or a pen on it, that swings around like this and that allows us to draw that circle through that point on it. That point can be close or far away. We're going to assume that we can open up our compass as far as we need to so we can draw circles of any radius about any point. Then the fourth postulate is that any two right angles are equal. Okay, so by a right angle, Euclid is referring to the notion of perpendicularity. So he assumes that you know what perpendicularity is, that this line and this line are perpendicular. This line is sort of lying evenly between uh, this line in some sense. It's not tilted in one direction or another. It's, uh, it's perpendicular. And what he's saying here, this postulate, is that if you make one perpendicular pair like that and another perpendicular pair, then in terms of the angle, we're going to consider this angle and this angle to be the same. So these are equal configurations for Euclid. And the fifth and most famous and contentious postulate is the parallel postulate, which says that if you have a line and you have a point which is not lying on the line, then there's exactly one line that you can draw through this point which is parallel to the given line. Okay, so that would be, let's see if I can draw it. That looks about parallel. All right, so there is a line through the given point which is supposedly parallel to this other line. And what does that mean? Well, for Euclid it meant that even if we extend these lines, then they will never meet. So that was Euclid's understanding of what parallel meant. You can extend them in either direction and they will never meet. And the postulate is that there's exactly one line through this point that's parallel to this given line. It's maybe a bit more complicated and has a slightly different character than the other four postulates and historically of course this played a very important role as people try to see whether they could prove this from the other postulates and the other assumptions that are used in Euclid's framework. Okay, so all these postulates in terms of constructions the ones that are going to be important for us are the first three because they correspond to constructions. Constructing a straight line between two points, extending a line, and drawing a circle with a center through a point. There is a lot to be gained by looking carefully at Euclid's work. By studying his constructions we start to appreciate more the logical structure of mathematics because Euclid's text was the first and most important model for our current way of presenting mathematics and thinking about mathematics. Now we start out with definitions and perhaps some assumptions which are clearly laid out and then we try to proceed in terms of theorems and proofs. We make statements and then we try to prove those statements. And the, the further we go, well the theorems can get more complicated but each time the proof should rely on what you've already established beforehand. You're never allowed to reach into the hat and pull out a rabbit that you have not yet established. This kind of logical continuity was a model for the way we think about mathematics. Very, very important in the last 2,000 years in terms of the development of mathematics and science. It also teaches us the importance of constructing things or mathematical objects before theorizing about them. This is a lesson that has been perhaps a little bit forgotten in the 20th century and in the 21st century, at least the beginnings of the 21st century. In the earlier times, when Euclid was very much in people's minds, the importance of constructions was clear to them because Euclid taught us to think in terms of constructions. 
In the 20th century, Euclid was dropped more and more from the school curriculum, and so the importance of constructions correspondingly started to decline. And now the students in mathematics, and even professional pure mathematicians, are inclined to create mathematical objects by talking about them, by stringing together phrases like, let G be a something or other, or let alpha be a something or other. Instead of making a construction and exhibiting the object first, and then talking about it. Okay. This is a very important point that I'm going to say more about in my Math Foundations lecture. But you should be aware that we have changed our approach to the importance of construction. If you're a modern student, you're under a little bit of a disadvantage in that you have not learned this lesson as well as you might have. Another important reason for studying Euclid is that Euclid in some sense is coming back in fashion due to the power and the usefulness of modern dynamic geometry packages. So these are software programs like Geometer Sketchpad, CAR, which stands for Compass and Ruler, GeoGebra, Cinderella, Cabri, there are others. These programs mimic pretty well directly the constructions that Euclid is able to make. And so, if you're working with these tools, then very likely you're going to end up meeting the same kinds of issues that, in fact, Euclid dealt with more than 2,000 years ago. All right, so I must say the 20th century's abandoning of Euclid is really a main factor, in my opinion, in the current weakness of maths education. It has weakened maths education because this logical continuity, which used to be fore and foremost in mathematics, has been dropped away. And it's also impacted quite a lot on research level mathematics, which now has a kind of ephemeral stratospheric aspect, not always connected with solid reality through explicit constructions. So we learn something about about our own mathematics and about our own research, even if we're pure mathematicians, by thinking about Euclid and his constructions. All right, so what I propose to do now is to actually go through the constructions in, in book one, at least the first few of them, and, uh, and show you how Euclid thought about these things. And I'm gonna present them in perhaps sometimes a slightly different way than Euclid did. I'm gonna change the order in particular to make it a little bit more logically coherent as far as I'm concerned from, from our modern point of view. All right. But it's really essentially just going back to Euclid. All right, so the first problem is actually proposition one of book one. So it's the very first thing that Euclid does. And it is to construct an equilateral triangle on a base. Right. So Euclid starts, the first thing he's going to do, he's going to say, well, we're going to start with a line segment, and we want to construct an equilateral triangle. So that's a triangle, three points, each of whose sides is equal. Okay, so I can sort of eyeball it, something like that, but I want an actual concrete, explicit, correct construction. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to write down the solutions. I'm going to show you the solutions by doing them myself here. And you'll have to forgive me that my circles are not perfect circles because I'm just going to draw them freehand. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our compass. And we're going to open our compass and put one point on A and the other point on B. And so we're going to draw a circle centered at A through B. Alright, so let me see if I can do that. So centered at A, circle through B. Okay, and I don't need the full circle, I'm just going to draw part of it. And then we're going to do the same thing with B. We're going to start by placing the center of the compass at B, and placing the other point at A, and drawing a circle through A centered at B. It's going to be another circle like this. And where those two circles meet, we're going to draw a point. And then we're going to use that point 
to construct two lines. Line AB, or the line AC, and the line BC. And there is our equilateral triangle. And we can see that this side is equal to this side because they're connected by this circle centered at A. And similarly, AB is equal to BC because of this circle here. Now, if you're a young person and you practice doing this, and it's an excellent thing for young people to practice, you probably don't appreciate that there is a logical subtlety here, that Euclid is a little bit finessing. The logical possible problem is, how do we actually know that these two circles meet in a point? That wasn't actually one of our postulates. In fact, it's hard to frame such a postulate correctly because it's easy enough to give examples of circles that don't meet. So saying when two circles meet and when they don't is a rather subtle issue. That Euclid is finessing here. Nevertheless, I think most young people would be very happy with this construction. And it's a good thing for young people to do. Our second problem, actually we're going to jump to Proposition 9. Okay? So Proposition 9 is a statement that's more or less this, to bisect an angle. It's not perhaps what you might think of as a modern proposition, which is stating a fact about something. It's rather a recipe for doing something. So Proposition 9 is telling us how to bisect an angle. All right, so here's the angle that we're interested in. And for Euclid, an angle was really a geometrical configuration formed by two intersecting lines. So most of the time when Euclid talks about an angle, he means a configuration that's like this. Uh, we'd like to bisect this angle. Well, how do we do that? Well, we choose a point on one of these lines, and then we're going to draw a circle centered at A. Let's call this point something. Let's call it B. And then we're going to put our compass center here through B, and we're going to draw a circle centered at A through B. And then we're going to see where that circle meets the second line. Let's call that point C. All right, now we can join those two points. And now we're going to apply the first construction. We're going to construct an equilateral triangle on the base BC. So I'm not going to iterate that. I'm going to assume we already know how to do that. So we're going to construct an equilateral triangle, perhaps something like this. All right, that's an equilateral triangle constructed just like we did over there with the base BC. So we're going to get this third point out here somewhere. I should draw it in red. And then we're going to connect this third point. Let's call it D with the original point A. And that line then will bisect the angle BC. All right, that's a nice construction. One should also point out there's a little bit of ambiguity here as well because the circle that we originally drew meets this line in the point C, yes, but if we extend this line, it's really still the same line, there's another point down here somewhere that this circle also meets. And so if we had used that second circle, then we would have gotten a different bisector. And so we see that, in fact, the construction really potentially gives us two bisectors to an angle, which is quite uh, reasonable uh, geometrically. In our next construction, Number three, we're going to look at Proposition 10, which is to bisect a line segment. And this is, again, pretty well exactly Euclid's wording of the proposition. So the story is that we have a line segment. In other words, we have two points and the line connecting them, A, B. And we would like to find a point which is halfway between A and B. So what do we do? Well, we construct an equilateral triangle on AB. 
Same construction we had before, giving us an equilateral triangle with a third point somewhere up there. See? And then hopefully this looks something like an equilateral triangle. And then we're going to use that third point C and realize that there's an angle here. So the angle formed by this line and this line can be bisected. That's what we just did in the previous construction. So we can bisect that angle and when we do, in other words when this angle and that angle are equal in the construction we had before, then this line here will meet the original base in a new point which we can then establish is the midpoint, let's say M, of AB. Now of course there's something to be proven with these constructions. This is a claim and Euclid will have some argument that convinces you that actually this point M is indeed halfway between A and B. In terms of compass that would mean that if you put a compass uh, with center M and drew the circle, say going through B, that circle would also go through A. So now we can construct the the center of a line segment or the midpoint of a line segment. In our fourth example we're going to go to proposition 11 which is to raise a perpendicular line to a line from a point on it. So it means that we have a line like this and we have a point say A on this line. Now what we'd like to do is we would like to construct a line that's perpendicular to the original line through the point A. So straight up and down, not at an angle this way or not an angle this way, exactly straight up and down, perpendicular to this one. So what do we do? Well, we get our compass and we put its center at A and the other point we'll just choose some random other point on this line. We'll draw a circle through this point, center at A, something like that, and we'll see where it meets the line in the second point. And let's call these points, say, B and C. And then we're going to create an equilateral triangle with base BC. Okay, so there's an equilateral triangle here. We can construct that. And then we're going to connect this new point, let's call it D, with our original point A. And if we do that well, we will then get a line which is perpendicular to the original. So we call that raising a perpendicular from a point on the line. The, the perpendicular is coming out from the line because the point that we've got is actually on the line. Our next problem is Proposition 12 of Book 1, which is to drop a perpendicular line to a line from a point not on it. So the starting configuration is we again have a line, and now we have a point which is not on the line. And what we want to do is we want to construct, in exactly as is we, in the previous problem, we want to construct this perpendicular line to our original line, which now goes through the point A off the line. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we start with choosing a point on the line somewhere, opening our compass so that its center is at A, and passing through this point. And we're going to draw a circle centered at A, passing through this point. Let's call it B. Then that circle will, as you can see, meet the line at another point. Let's call that C. And then we can draw or construct an equilateral triangle on the base BC. You can see we're using this equilateral triangle construction quite a lot, so it's actually reasonably important first uh, construction. Now, of course, when we construct an equilateral triangle, we have two um, places to do it. We could draw an equilateral triangle on this side or on this side. 
If we do it on this side, we might run the risk that this point that we're going to get is getting pretty close to A. So I'm going to actually construct the equilateral triangle so that it's going out in this direction. All right. And then this new point uh, D here, then I'm going to connect that to the original point uh, A to, whoop, to obtain our perpendicular line. Okay, in our sixth construction problem, it's actually a jump. We're going to go to Proposition 31, which is to draw a parallel line to a line through a point not on it. Now I'm changing the order of these uh, constructions and I'm also changing a little bit the, the approach. Okay? And uh, that's particularly true in this example here because I'd like you to think about parallel lines in a different way than Euclid did. Okay? So the way I want you to think about this construction is the following. So what we were trying to do is we're trying to construct this line that goes through this point which is parallel to this one. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this in two steps. We're going to first of all drop the perpendicular from this point, maybe we should call it A, to the line. We're going to drop a perpendicular. That's exactly using the previous construction. All right. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take this line with this point A on it and we're going to raise a perpendicular to it. So I'm going to construct a line through A which is perpendicular to this existing line. That's the previous construction of raising a perpendicular from a line through a point on it. And then I want you to think about this as an alternative definition of what parallel means. So I think Euclid was not quite on the right track when he defined parallel lines to be lines which don't meet. Why not? Well, so let's consider these two lines. Are they parallel or are they not? Well, it's very tricky to say because to establish that they're parallel, how are you going to do that? You're going to extend these lines and see whether they meet or not. Well, you could possibly determine if they do meet because the lines will eventually come together and you might be able to see that point of intersection if it's not too far away. But if those lines really are parallel, how are you ever going to determine that? Suppose we go a few thousand miles in this direction and they're still roughly parallel. Can we deduce and when, at what point can we deduce that those lines are really parallel? So this definition of lines being parallel when they don't meet is actually not such a good one. This is, in fact, a better definition of parallel. All right. This is a better definition of parallel. Now, it's always dangerous to claim that you have a little bit of an improvement on Euclid. And no doubt people will, uh, will debate this. But there is some good evidence uh, that becomes much clearer when you go to other geometries. In particular, when you go to hyperbolic geometry, you find out that this is a very powerful notion. In fact, a very important notion. And so it's uh, very good to have this under your belt when you go from Euclidean geometry to non-Euclidean geometry. Well, if we do adopt this a point of view towards parallel, then what is the parallel postulate? The parallel postulate would be that if we draw or make this configuration that this is the only line with the property that it's not meeting this one. So there's only one line through this point which is not meeting this one and that's the parallel, namely the line that's perpendicular to the perpendicular. That would be the, the way you could rewrite the postulate if you wanted to change your definition of parallel. All right, but in any case, this is in practice a very simple and easy and effective construction for constructing a line that's parallel to a given line through a point not on it. All right, so our next construction problem actually goes back to Proposition 2. 
So in Euclid's development, this, or actually a closely related one, not exactly this one, but something that's pretty close to it, is Proposition 2. But I think it's more advantageous for modern students to see this particular construction because it fits in naturally with linear algebra and vector ideas. Right, so it's a little bit preferable to Euclid's statement and Euclid's proof, if I'm allowed to suggest that. Okay, so how are we going to translate a line segment? That's what we're trying to do. So we have a line segment AB, and we want to translate it to, say, the point C. What does that mean? Well, it means I want another line segment which is equal to this one and which has the same direction. In other words, which is parallel to it. All right, so what are we going to do? Well, we are going to start by connecting A and C, giving us a line. And then we're going to use the previous construction of drawing a parallel to draw a parallel to AB through C. All right. So using that double perpendicularity, we're going to be able to construct a line through C which is parallel to AB. Maybe I'll extend it a little bit further. We're always allowed to extend lines, remember. And now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the same construction and find a line that's going through B parallel to AC. Does that look about parallel? There. Alright, so the idea is that these two lines have been created parallel, which we'll denote with these little arrows, and these two lines are also parallel. So this is a parallelogram. And this point up here that we found this way is the point that we're really interested in. So now we can prove, and some work is perhaps required, that the segment CD is really equal to the segment AB, not only in length, but also in direction. So that's a little bit more than what Euclid establishes in Proposition 2. It's actually a very important construction to be able to translate a vector, something with size and also direction. All right, now problem eight, which doesn't have a direct uh, analog in Euclid's work, but it's an important construction, so I feel it's important to identify it, certainly in the spirit of Euclid, is to draw a circle given a center and a radius. So the situation is we have some segment over here, AB, and we would like to draw a circle centered at C, which has the same radius as AB. So it should be roughly about like this circle, about that size. Now we're not assuming that our compass allows us to do the following. We're not allowed to put our compass on here and then lift it up and move it over here to transfer length that way. So Euclid's Proposition 2 makes it clear that he's not allowing the compass to be able to do that. So it's a collapsible compass. As soon as you pick it off the paper, it sort of folds. You cannot retain its information. All right, but we can solve this problem easily enough because of the previous construction. We know how to translate AB to C. So suppose we do that. There's AB. And suppose we translate that using what we just did, say to get this segment CD. And then we can just use this point and this center. That is a legitimate construction. We can create the circle. So that's all very nice, but there is perhaps one small snag that maybe some of you will have noticed. What would happen if this point C happened to be lined up with the line AB? In fact, if C was actually on AB, then this first construction here wouldn't really work so well. So think about what happens here. Here's AB and here's the point C. What would happen if C was, say, right here along the line AB? Then these parallel lines that we're trying to construct all sort of collapse. 
So that's a sort of a special case that also needs to be considered. And in fact, we need to do a little bit more in that special case. So I'll just say what you need to do without writing it down. But if C happened to be uh, on AB itself, we would have to proceed by translating this segment in two steps. First, what we would do is we would take this segment and translate it to some point off of AB just choose some random point somewhere and translate AB to that random point and then translate that new segment back to the point C. We, in other words, we'd have to do the same procedure twice effectively. And so conceivably that could be happening here too. If A, B, and C lined up, we would have to translate this thing once and then twice to get uh, this radius that we can construct the circle from. And our final problem will be essentially Proposition 22 of Book 1, which is to construct a triangle given its three sides as segments. So we are given three segments, say A, B, C, D, and E, F, somewhere on the page. And over here, perhaps, we want to construct a triangle, a triangle made out of three points. And we want the sides of that triangle to be these three segments here. All right, so what we can do is we can start by translating one of the segments. It doesn't really matter which one it is. So let's suppose that uh, for convenience I'll choose the longest one, say CD. So I'm now going to transfer CD, say ho hopefully something like that. I'm now translating CD to get this uh, segment over here. In fact, it's not necessary that it be parallel to the original. It happens to be, but that's not uh, crucial. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to translate A, B, and E, F as well, but we're going to put them uh, in particular places. So I'm going to now take A, B, and I'm going to translate it so that one of its points is this one here. Okay, so the way I've translated, we're actually going to get a parallel vector. So we're going to get, uh, say, something like this, roughly. That's supposed to be the translate of AB. And then we're going to translate uh, EF, and we're going to use this other point down here. So maybe we'll translate EF. And we'll get something that looks sort of like this. All right, so we've done three translations. So the CD got translated to that central segment. The AB got translated to that segment there. And the EF got translated to that there. Well, we don't have a triangle yet. How are we going to get a triangle with those three sides? What we're going to do is we're going to put our compass here and open it to this segment and create a circle centered at this point with this radius. And then we're going to take our compass and put its center here and open it to this point and create a circle like this. And no, those two circles are going to meet. Well, hopefully they're going to meet. They will meet if the lengths of these segments are suitably chosen. So they have to satisfy the so-called triangle inequality, and Euclid is aware of that and mentions that. In other words, if one of the segments or two of the segments are a lot smaller than the third one, it's not going to work. But you can see here that the two circles meet. In fact, they meet in this point and in this point. And we can choose either one of them to create our triangle. Let's say, let's use this one here. So we'll finish our triangle. And now I hope you can see that the sides of this triangle are exactly the three original sides. This side here is the same as CD. This side here is the same as this one here, which was the same length as AB. And this one here, it's the same 
size as EF, and so that one there is also the same size as EF. So those are most of the construction problems of book one. There are in fact four or five other ones which concern areas and they have a little bit of a different character and possibly I will talk about them at some later point. I hope I've motivated you to dip a little bit into Euclid and have a look at what this most famous math text of all time actually looks like. It would be really great if more math teachers, math students, math professors had a look at Euclid and especially a look at the, the logical clarity of it. A good place to do that is David Joyce's online version of Euclid's Elements. Um, if you Google David Joyce and Euclid's Elements, you will come to his site and it's a very nice place where you can read all of, uh, all of what's uh, in Euclid. In our next famous math problem, we're going to fast forward a few millennia to the uh, Irish mathematician Hamilton and his discovery of quaternions in the context of trying to understand rotations of three-dimensional space. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.